This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the Southeast and across the country, focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Oh, you see the smile? Do you see it? It's real, it's genuine. A, because it's good to see you again, and B, because Jennifer is back, and bottom line, it wasn't the same without her the past two weeks. Well, thanks, Ray. It's good to be back, especially given all the incredible stories we plan to bring you. Straight ahead, grab the sunscreen and beach gear, because we're taking you to Jekyll Island for the one event that brings together future ag leaders for learning, networking, and community building. Also on the show, struggling to stay afloat, how overseas competition is threatening Georgia's shrimping industry and what it means for your next seafood dinner. Plus, did you know, Jennifer, that July is National Watermelon Month? Stop it, no yeah, way. Yes, it's true. And to celebrate, we're diving into some sweet and spicy watermelon recipes that will blow your mind, including a watermelon hot sauce. All this and so much more right now on The Farm Monitor. The beach, palm trees, Jekyll Island. Is there a better setting for Georgia Farm Bureau's Young Farmers and Ranchers Leadership Conference? But as John Holcomb tells us, the event is more than just a destination vacation. For those who attend, it's also a valuable resource. There was plenty of fellowship, learning, and friendly competition this year on Jekyll Island as Georgia Farm Bureau held its annual Young Farmer and Rancher Summer Leadership Conference, an event that aims to engage like-minded members by giving them community and confidence they need to advocate and protect the state's ag industry back home. What we hope when people come and experience Summer Leadership Conference is that they really, number one, gain confidence, confidence to advocate for agriculture and for the industry, confidence to be successful on their operations or in their jobs, um, but also more than anything, we want them to gain a community. Uh, we want them to find fellow members that are like-minded. You know, sometimes agriculture can be really challenging. It's a challenging field. Um, and so having those people that they can call and lean on um, that are going through similar life stages um, and things in life is just really helpful. The importance of the yearly event can't be overstated. As Barry says, this event is tailored specifically with GFB's young farmers and ranchers in mind. It's one of the few opportunities that these members have to get off of the farm and get together and network with each other, meet each other, but also hopefully take valuable information that they've gained from breakout sessions or keynote speakers or just sitting down at the dinner table with fellow members back to their operation, back to their homes and communities and implement those. Of course, no conference would be complete without a theme. And this year, that theme was digging in which describes the passion and grit producers have for the ag industry and the opportunities a conference like this one can offer them. And I think it was best expressed by our speaker yesterday, Joey Jones, uh, but what he spoke about during that uh, presentation was about responsibility and I think that that's a great way to describe digging in because we have to dig in in our communities and our counties on our farms or on our ranches and figure out what those responsibilities are that we need to do each and every day uh, to, to be successful in our operations and so I think the conference really embodies that uh, it's it's a challenge for us to, to dig in and figure out what what it is that we're going to take home uh, to employ to make our operations better to take that responsibility that we have of producing food and fiber for a growing world. As stated, the conference also offers educational opportunities, one of which is the important component of the YFNR program and organization as a whole, advocacy, in which members got to hear why staying engaged with elected officials is crucial. One of the big things we talked about today with advocacy was uh, really two parts. Um, of advocacy was not only advocating to other farmers um, that are in your community and explaining the importance to them of getting out and voting, but also advocating in the more traditional sense to elected officials. Um, you know, elected officials this time of year are on the campaign trail. They're out getting out and seeing constituents, and they're very active this time of year. They're hosting a lot of events. And what we encouraged our folks to do was to get out and take those opportunities for these public meetings, um, take the opportunity to get out to these candidate forums and these fundraisers and things like that, and really get in front of their elected officials. 
reporting from Jekyll Island for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Staying on the coast, it is now shrimping season here in Georgia, and if you thought there were fewer boats along the coastline this year, you're not wrong. Between the low commodity price and rising input costs, getting out on the water has become more challenging than ever. Damon Jones has the story from Brunswick. Ask any visitor to the Georgia coast what they're hoping to eat, and seafood will likely be the overwhelming favorite, specifically freshly caught shrimp. However, the industry has really struggled over the past year due mainly to overseas competition. You know, it's no secret that shrimp's the number one type of seafood we eat here in this country and that there's a, a large dependence on foreign shrimp. But because of the pandemic uh, and because of market shifts, you had a lot of foreign shrimp flood the market this past year that weren't able to, you know, in previous years get here. And that just overabundance of imported shrimp coming into the market really made it challenging for our domestic industry to really move their products. For that reason, shrimpers have either had to find creative ways to market their products like direct to consumer sales in prepackaged meals or get out of the business completely. When you take into all the overhead cost of maintaining your boat, trying to find a crew, being able to get a, a price that can compete you know, with what you see on that foreign level, it really makes it challenging economically for a lot of the industry members to, to stay in it. That's why buying local whenever possible is so important despite the higher price tag as you're not just paying for quality and freshness, but also supporting the Georgia economy. You know, when consumers go to the grocery store and they see why is this shrimp so much more expensive than one that might come from another country, you gotta realize what goes into that from the minute it's harvested to, to handle, process, and distributed. And I think that's a key message Message. Every time you buy, you know, that local shrimp or that domestic product, you're helping to provide some economic stability in a very um, challenging environment right now for our industry. And it's been that way for the past decade, which is why the future of Georgia's shrimping industry is in such doubt with the next generation looking for other options. Traditionally, shrimping and a lot of our commercial fishermen, you know, th these are typically, you know, traditions that were passed on through generations and a lot of that younger generation they're saying, we're, you know, we're not going to get into it. And so there is that concern of where is our, our industry going to come from? Because it's not just the, the fishermen themselves, but do we have the processors? Do we have the distributors? I mean, it's when we look at our food systems, whether we're talking about a land-based ag product or a fish, we have to have an intact food system. And that is something that has made it more and more challenged for people to stay in. It's a harsh reality that could have a major impact on a number of communities along coastal Georgia. This is part of that identity of the Georgia coast when they come here, being able to, to see these shrimp boats or somebody, you know, harvesting crabs. And that's something not only from a cultural aspect, but from an economic aspect that a lot of our smaller coastal communities vitally depend on. Um, and it has ramifications through tourism um, and other sectors along our coast. Reporting from Brunswick, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Up next, it's a watermelon with bite. Discover the secrets behind this watermelon shark with some mouth-watering recipes. Watermelon. There's nothing like that sweet, refreshing taste to cool the summer heat. Let's find out how Georgia watermelon gets from the farm to your table. Did you know that watermelon is actually a fruit and a vegetable? It belongs to the same family of plants that include cucumbers and pumpkins. Like other melons, it grows on a vine. Farmers plant watermelon seeds, or tiny plants, from the nursery in rows of 8 to 12 feet apart to give them plenty of room. In just one month, the vine can spread six to eight feet along the ground. Honeybees must pollinate the yellow watermelon blossoms before the vine can produce fruit. Within 60 days, the vine produces its first watermelons, but it can take a full three months before they are fully grown. 
A pale green or yellow belly spot will appear on the underside of the melon. When the leaves on the stem dry out and wilt, it's time to harvest. Watermelon is still picked by hand. Workers carefully put the melons into trucks and transport them to a packing house. Here the melons are washed and cleaned before they are sent to market. Choosing the perfect watermelon is a simple three-step process. First, look at the melon to check for cuts and bruises. Next, lift the melon to see if it feels heavy, because watermelon is 92% water. Finally, turn the melon over to find that creamy yellow spot that indicates full ripeness. Watermelon provides a good source of vitamin A and potassium. It's low in calories and fat, and even protects your skin from the harmful effects of the sun. Look for Georgia-grown watermelons in a grocery store or produce stand near you this summer. Do not adjust your TV set. Yes, folks, that is a watermelon shark. And today we are turning the tables. We are going to eat the shark instead of the shark eating us. Why? Well, the entire month is National Watermelon Month. Yes, July, National Watermelon Month. And here to talk about that and show us some incredible recipes, Dr. Tracy Brigman, registered dietitian, or as I like to call her, the doctor of goodness. It's my new nickname for you. Okay. Right. <laughs> but yes, watermelon is so versatile. And being that it's very, very hot right now, You've got some really good recipes. I do. So we're going to do a spicy watermelon recipe and we're going to do a sweet one. We're going right. to start with the spicy one. Um, it's going to be a, a watermelon hot sauce. So chicken wings, hot sauce. Um, Don't knock it until you try it. That's right. It's really good. So I'm going to put three and a half cups of chopped watermelon in a blender. And then we're going to add 12 serrano peppers that have been halved and seeded. Okay, we don't, the seeds are gonna make it a lot hotter than it should be, so we're, we wanna take that out. Then we have a half a cup of shredded carrots, three cloves of garlic, and that's three green onions that are roughly chopped. I don't have to do a lot of chopping because the blender's gonna do all that for me. And now we do the liquid ingredients. That is a third of a cup of lime juice, also has vitamin C. That is a quarter cup of white vinegar and a half a cup of water, and a half a teaspoon of salt. There you go. Then we're gonna put on the handy dandy lid, making sure everything is, yes. Put it's gonna be a loud one today. And we're gonna blend this for about a minute until it's well blended and smooth. Once it has been well blended for a minute, I'm gonna pour this into a saucepan hold the blade so it doesn't go in there with it. Oh, I can smell the peppers. Mm -hmm. I am going to simmer this for 25 minutes, stirring occasionally. So while it's simmering, I can make my chicken wings. So whether I'm gonna fry them or bake them, I don't want them breaded um, because we're gonna make a hot sauce out of this once we're done. So I'm gonna put this on the stove top, simmer for 25 minutes. All right, so my Watermelon hot sauce has simmered for 25 minutes and then I let it cool for about 15 minutes to let those ingredients continue to meld a little bit. And as I said, you have your chicken wings hot and ready to make this hot sauce. So that is a cup of the prepared hot sauce. We're gonna put it in here. here. And you can see it's a little chunky, but that's all the goodness. If, if you're a texture person, you can strain it, but I don't recommend because that's all your nutrients, those chunks of carrots and whatnot. And then you're going to add three tablespoons of melted butter. You're blocking our view. Sorry. <laughs> three butter. tablespoons of melted butter. And then we're just going to stir that together. So I want this to be warm. I want my hot sauce to be warm temp in temperature, and I want my wings to be warm in temperature. Mm -hmm. And then I simply, oops, I simply just cover and toss. And that's it. And there is our, our watermelon hot sauce. Moving on and right off the bat, before I get smacked again with a wooden spoon, we are making sherbet. Sherbet. Sherbet, not sherbet. That's right. Sherbet. Sherbet. Watermelon. Watermelon sherbet. Sherbet. Yeah. So, yes. Yes. So it starts with frozen watermelon. So I cut up watermelon last night and froze it. I froze it on a tray 
because if you freeze it in a bag or in a bowl, it clumps together and then you don't can't fit it in the food processor. So this is six cups or about two pounds. I like weighing stuff because it's more accurate, but if you don't have a scale, that's six cups. So we're gonna take that six cups of frozen watermelon and put it in our food processor. Okay. Once I have my six cups or two pounds in there, I have a cup of sweetened condensed milk and that is a little bit less than a can. So you actually do have to measure it. I was hoping I could just pour in a can, but it doesn't work that way. Okay. And then that is a quarter teaspoon of kosher salt. So once we have all our ingredients in, we put the lid on, we're gonna blend it for three to five minutes. We want it to be smooth. So I'm gonna empty my sherbet mm -hmm. into a bowl. I'm gonna place it in the freezer for two hours until solid and then it's gonna be ready for service. That's it, so I'm gonna cover it, put it in the freezer for two hours till it's solid. It will stay in my freezer for about a week. When it's done, it looks like that, looks watermelon like that. sherbet. Watermelon sherbet. And if you want to, you can add some dark chocolate chips, make it look like seeds. Um, dark chocolate also has antioxidants oh, in it. <laughs> so we're making, I know I'm adding chocolate, but we're making it healthy with additional antioxidants. So that is our quick and easy watermelon sherbet. There you go. And you too can find this sherbet recipe by logging on to farm-monitor.com, going up to the very top. See the recipe section up there, everything there listed out in detail. Tracy, again, sending these recipes every single month to us. And uh, again, July, watermelon month, great time. Uh, you know, it's hot out. We all need uh, some cooling off. What better way than watermelon? That's sure. right. So. Yep. Tracy, thank you so all much. Right. Thank you for watching, and we will see you next month. Tracy, Ray, thanks so much. Well, if you're ready to explore the amazing world of agriculture, either on your phone or computer screen, the Farm Monitor has you covered. Check out our website, farm-monitor.com, for engaging articles and videos. Also, there's our YouTube channel, where you can catch up on missed episodes and past stories. From inspiring farmer profiles to deep agricultural insights, there's something for everyone. When we come back, how industrial biotechnology and corn is revolutionizing the production of fuels, plastics, and pharmaceuticals, while also advancing sustainable agriculture. Hi, I'm Mallory Harvey. I'm from Appling County, and uh, we farm cotton, peanuts, and then we've got four breeder houses with Pilgrim's Pride Poultry. Um, as a young boy, uh, I, I learned a lot from being around my grandfather and all the guys, the workers that come along the way as far as learning from them and my granddad. And uh, through the years, I've watched a lot of other successful farmers too around the area. and kind of watch how they farmed as well as my granddad and tried to put that all together and that's really how I started learning how to do what I do now. So I was actively involved with um, the Applin Leeds program in our county and uh, we were asked to, to be able to go to a local pre-K and uh, you know teach them about peanuts and, and what it takes to grow a peanut crop and show them actual peanut plant. And so that's good for the youth that doesn't, that's disconnected from farming. As a young farmer, I, I do see a strong need in teaching the younger generation uh, about farming and where their food comes from because I believe there's a big disconnect uh, and, and where our food comes from. And so uh, it's very important for them to learn that and uh, see the need for what we do as farmers. We deal with a lot of problems on the farm on a daily basis. Uh, I would say um, just trying to uh, trying to cure any kind of insect pressure that we may have, uh, disease pressure, um, equipment teardowns to um, weather related problems. We can't control weather or or our prices that we get on our crops. So that that's something that we. We do the best that we can do and 
let the Lord do his work from there. I love farming uh, because I get to be home every night with my family. Uh, I get to get to bring them up around farming and get to get to, for them to be able to see what I seen growing up and uh, just hopefully being able to pass that down to the next generation. Finally this week, proof once again that corn isn't just for food anymore. That's right. Produced by the National Corn Growers Association in collaboration with the Biotechnology Innovation Organization, this next story explores how corn is driving innovation and in sustainable production and helping to meet the needs of a growing global population. What if we could sustainably produce many of the materials that modern society needs, like fuels, plastics, pharmaceuticals, and have food and feed for a growing world population? Today, industrial biotechnology is producing novel foods, entirely new materials for manufacturing and low carbon sustainable fuels. Industrial biotechnology extends the diversity of natural products and production to create an ever growing list of high tech foods feeds, materials, and fuels. The achievements of the past century have transformed our global standard of living. However, we are just getting started. As new technologies are widely implemented, the speed of advancement is increasing dramatically. This is resulting in improved production organisms, making products that were impossible to produce just a few years ago. We take those alcohols, the ethanol, the isobutanol, and we simply do a chemical process then and transform them into ethylene or butylene. Those are primary building blocks that the chemical industry has long since optimized and knows how to use. Which means then, from those two things, you can make darn near everything. That's what's possible to do, including all the fuels, but also all the plastics. So it is a different world, and that's because the biotechnology is so advanced, the fermentation technologies are so advanced that all these things are possible now. One of the very exciting things about molecules from biomass is we can access molecules that we can't get to from petrochemicals. And that allows us to make products that give different performance properties. And we as consumers always want to improve products, uh, whether they be better uh, performance in use, but also lower environmental footprints. And we, we're just not gonna get there with petrochemicals. That technology is mature. So where are the next generation products gonna come from? And it's inevitably biomass. And so what I'm excited about is we have the infrastructure in the United States, the growth of crops, the biotechnology that's really needed to lead that, uh, lead that area globally. In parallel with the gains made in industrial biotech, so too has agricultural technology made enormous strides forward, allowing more crops to be produced on less land, using fewer chemicals and resources than ever in history. This further improves the environmental benefit for renewable projects. Corn is abundant, affordable, and sustainable, which makes it the perfect feedstock for chemical uses and industrial uses. As technology in those areas advances, so does the technology that we use to produce corn in a sustainable manner. As we grow corn in a more sustainable manner and we use less fertilizer and chemicals, uh, it reduces our carbon footprint, which in, in return reduces the carbon footprint of corn as a feedstock. Industrial biotech creates good jobs for a diverse set of people across a wide range of geographies. To meet the needs of a growing global society, significant strides have and are being made, but the industry will most quickly reach its great potential with good policy we strongly encourage national incentives and support to drive this industry forward. Well, you hear the music. Unfortunately, that means we're out of time. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. Stay safe. Have a great week.